morning, and thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be part of this program this morning, and I'm going to actually be able, happily, to stay most of the morning until right before noon, and uh, bless the work that's going to go on here. I think it's going to have a significant impact in the way we all move forward to do the very best jobs that we can when it comes to uh, looking out for the welfare of children in the world. And I want to thank um, the director, Ravi Shah, when the secretary and the president looked all over the world to find someone to run an agency that has had tremendous challenges, although some very excellent leadership. In my view, they couldn't have found anyone uh, better than the gentleman that we just heard from. He's gifted, he's been described in, in his introduction, but he's such a big thinker and a bold thinker and an exciting new leader for our country. So it's really been a pleasure for me to get to work with him. And um, this procurement reform is not that sexy, but we, we both think it's very important. So the two of us, despite the fact that it doesn't fly as high as some of the other more interesting topics, we know ultimately it could have a tremendous impact. As instead of um, the foreign aid that we provide, uh, providing really a economic development opportunity for America, it becomes a real capacity building opportunity for the countries that we're trying to serve. And in the spirit of servant leadership, which is I think what the U.S. should be about and often is, uh, it's really imperative that we change this dynamic. And when we purchase items to serve people in Guatemala, the more items we can purchase in Guatemala, as opposed to in the United States, would really help. Sometimes this flies in the face of politics at home, but it's the right thing to do, and I'm happy to put my name on those efforts um, in every way I can. I also want to thank um, uh, Robert Clay, who stepped in and uh, has uh, taken over uh, this effort, and I really thank him um, uh, for his leadership and uh, it's very, very important that this effort that was started before he was in his position has culminated in this event and hopefully many other opportunities. And I didn't see Gary Newton, but I hope he's here because he's the instigator of a lot of this. I don't know if Gary's here, but let's give both Robert and Gary a round of applause. big budget can do. So Gary did a great job convening us all. He's got a big heart and a great vision and a wonderful mind. And without a lot of money, he has done a tremendous amount of work in the last uh, six years. Uh, Susan Jacobs is here, and I want to acknowledge uh, Susan's effort with the State Department right uh, under the watchful eye of, of Senator Clinton, Secretary Clinton. Um, I can't make that change. I don't know why. I feel like she was uh, Secretary Clinton, who, uh, as you can see in the package, provided us a, a wonderful letter. And as I've said, many places all over the world, including constantly in Washington, if there was ever a person on the planet that understood this issue, it is our Secretary of State. And we really owe her a debt of gratitude for all of that she does uh, from her position monitoring the big war and peace issues of the world to continue to stay focused on children and continuing to stay focused on the importance of children and families. And she's been working on this issue since she was literally a law student and continues to this day as one of the most powerful women on the planet. And a lot of times people in power you know, forget the issues that brought them to the table, but she's never, ever, ever forgotten this issue, and I want to acknowledge that. And the staff that works closest with her knows that, um, and we sure feel that uh, in Washington and in, in Congress. I also want to thank UNICEF. I believe that UNICEF is here, and this is one of the largest uh, children's organizations uh, in the world that minister to children. I, I want to thank them for their willingness to be a partner uh, in this effort. And I don't know if Save the Children is here. They're also um, in the billions there they are. UNICEF spends, what, about five to six billion a year? Save the Children is, what, two or three? 
largest organizations uh, in the world, and then all the rest of us kind of fill in, uh, fill in those gaps. So I wanted to just to say a few words um, uh, to kick us off, and I was so happy to hear the director say that the most vulnerable children in the world, and listen, there are many, many vulnerable children in the world. I mean, I don't know if you could say that half of the children in the world or two-thirds of the children of the world are vulnerable. I mean, the world is a very big place, and America is such a small piece. Even in our own country, when we think about the children who are poor and hungry and go to bed at night, um, hungry and, and crying and are insecure physically and emotionally and mentally, it's a big number. So when we meet to talk about strategies for vulnerable children, Two days, all year, a decade would not do it justice, because it's a big number. But I think what this conference is focused on, if we could, is the most vulnerable children in the world. The most vulnerable. The top 5 or 10 percent of all the vulnerable children in the world. And this group are, are children who are without family care. Now I realize that every family is not as fortunate and as blessed as the family that I've come from or many of your families. Two parent households, two parents with college degrees, nine children of 11 years, every single child healthy. My parents now have 37 grandchildren. My mother actually knows their names <laughs> and their birthdays, which is really um, and when we look out in the world, we realize what an exception to the rule that is. But we can always hope and not be discouraged that it is possible if we worked harder to try to connect every child to some family that's strong enough and willing and able to protect them may not be able to provide all the bells and whistles that many of our families have provided for us. First-rate education, opportunities to travel, enough food to eat. We had one pair of shoes, but you know what? It was enough. But I do believe, honestly believe, that the resources and the intelligence are here in this room and around the planet if we just coordinated a little bit better to be able to connect every child on the planet, every single one, with a family or a family member or a friend or an adult that would help to raise them. And if we focus the billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars that we're spending, finding them, feeding them, immunizing them, educating them, and just ask a simple question somewhere along the process. Where is your mother? Where is your father? If they don't have one, where is your aunt? Where is your uncle? Where is your friend? Where is your teacher? Where is your mentor? <coughs> and connect them to a family that will protect them support them for the rest of their life. We think in this community that we're trying to raise kids from 0 to 12, and if we can do a good job keeping them alive until they're 12 or 13 or 14 or 15 or 18, depending on what country you're living in, that we have achieved our goal. I'd like to ask any of you in this room, any of you, would you have walked out of your family at 18 and never called or checked in again for the rest of your life. Anybody here? I'm 56. I'm a United States Senator. I talked to my father last night. I talked to him three times a week. I check in with my parents all the time. Blanche Lincoln, who used to serve with me, now she goes a little overboard, 
She said she talks to her mother twice a day. I said, now Blanche, that is going a little too far. I'm just not going to do it. I'm just not going to do it. But Blanche, you know, that's the way Rice families are, I guess, in Arkansas. But I, I, I think we need to raise our sights as a community serving children to understand what children really, really need. And every human being on the planet really, really needs is a family to call their own for the rest of their life. And in my view, we are not doing a very good job of that. Now, I started an organization 15 years ago when I came here. I guess because I've been so blessed by this family, so blessed by my own family, my husband and our two children, that I thought, what is it that makes us in this field think that this is so impossible we can't even strive for? And what makes us believe that governments can raise children? Governments do a lot of things well. Raising children is one. Human beings raise kids. And if a child is separated from their family, and we've just seen some examples, whether it was the earthquake in Haiti or the, or the famine in, in the Sudan, we can do a better job of connecting the child and that sibling group with some relative or mentor, preferably in that community, in that country, to help raise them and support them. And when we don't do that, speaking from another little different angle as a woman and as the oldest of these nine children, I want you to know how changed my life would have been if my parents had been deceased or died. And I used to have nightmares about this growing up because I was a very responsible older sister. I used to think when I was 13 and cry myself to sleep thinking what would happen if my parents died because I felt responsible to raise the other eight. And I used to internalize this and I would think to myself, where will I get a job? Who will hire me? How will I feed them? Now, if you don't think that girls around this world are born in every culture understanding this is their responsibility, and we somehow, in our wild imaginations, think that it's okay for a 10-year-old girl to raise three siblings, or a 12-year-old girl to raise five siblings, and we think, well, they're fed, they have a hut to live in, and that's okay, she doesn't have to go to school, she can spend all of her time, which takes a lot of time to get firewood in some of these countries. You have to walk most of the day, and then when you finish with the firewood, then you have to walk for the water, and that's your day, that's your life. I think that we have to raise our sights way higher. And there are assets in this world, and there are people willing to help, and there are faith-based organizations and corporations that not only want to keep children in the families to which they're born, keep them attached to that birth family and help strengthen that birth family, but when events happen, earthquakes, fires, disasters, wars, that children find themselves orphaned by both family, by both parents, orphaned, a double orphan, and we need to get these terms a little straighter, to not just say, oh, well, that's fine, we'll just let that little group stay over there, and they can, you know, occasionally visit with these relatives, and they'll be fine. Let's work harder to connect children to families. When people say, well, Senator, what do you do about trafficking? Aren't you interested in trafficking? Say, so yes, I'm very interested in anti-trafficking, Ron. But the, the greatest protection against a child being trafficked are the strong arms of a parent. Did any of you all see that movie, Taken? Now, not every father is a CIA agent, and I don't think my father could have done that for me. But that's what I felt like I would do if I were a parent. I would have tracked them down to the other ends of the earth to get my child back. So if we put children in the arms of parents, 
or strong adult relatives or mentors, they are less likely to be trafficked. Now, I know some parents sell their children into slavery, and I understand that. Those are not the kind of parents that I'm talking about, and that we need to deal a different way with parents like that. And governments need to step in when parents are abusing their children and torturing their children and sending their children into slavery. There are ways that those parental rights can be separated. But I believe, and started the coalition, we call it the Coalition on Adoption, 160 members, but really, the real name for our organization should be the 160 members of Congress, or we are a coalition of Republicans and Democrats, 160 strong, some of the most powerful men and women on this planet. We are a coalition that believes that children should be served in and through families. The Congressional Coalition for Children and Families in the United States and around the world. And I believe we can do it, and I think this summit is one of the very first steps to see how we can coordinate our efforts better. And we know, in conclusion here, we know that institutional care is harmful to children. We know the effects when an infant or a child is not held and nurtured. Some of the scientists are beginning to believe it's irreparable, it can't be reversed. I mean, literally, it's a physical problem with the development of the brain. Now, I haven't in my heart gotten there because I'd like to believe, despite what the science tells me, that you can, you know, that love can conquer a lot and it can reverse some of these physical <coughs> detriments that happen to children and to orphans that are left to grow up themselves um, without the love and the nurture and support of parents. And even if the food is minimal, or even if the shelter is minimal, even if the opportunities are minimal, a, a, a human being can thrive off of love and support of that adult. So let's do a better job in what we're doing. Let's focus this conference. I know there are many, many vulnerable children in this world. As I said, I don't even know how to estimate the number. But if we focus on the most vulnerable, children that are without family care, whether they're on the streets, in institutions, whether the, the consequence or the, the action that separated them is war or famine or something else, and help to coordinate them in a family, and then wrap around our <coughs> services of food and education uh, and other opportunities and help around that family, and think about serving all of the children in the world in and through families as opposed to separate entities. I think we would be shocked, Rodney, at how well and how much we could advance this issue. So in conclusion, you've got my support. You have the support of 160 members of Congress. It is always fun for me, as Ambassador Jacobs knows, to talk about this issue because it's actually maybe the one issue in Washington we're not arguing about <laughs> that everybody agrees to and that we can move our agenda forward. So it's exciting uh, to be with you. And let's really believe that the miracle and the blessing of a family, whether you were a two-parent or one-parent family, think of your own children, think of what you're doing to raise your children and grandchildren. The blessing of a family can be a gift that we can give to every child in the world. And that gift will keep giving. And we would then have a world led by human beings that have been raised and nurtured by loving adults. I think the world in 50 years from now would be so much better and more stable if those were the kinds of individuals and leaders we were raising. So God bless you all. Thank you so much, and let's get to work. <laughs>